then we go to the legislative process at the National Assembly. Now, I recognize that not all of us may have uh, been involved in legislative advocacy, so this is just for the benefit of those who uh, are not familiar with the process of lawmaking uh, to give a sense of what happens during the lawmaking process. So this lays out very quickly how a bill becomes uh, law at the National Assembly. Um, but I have done a listing um, which I think would make it easier. Now, there are two ways the bill goes to the National Assembly. One is uh, through the executive, uh, which the president sends, that's the executive bill. And then the other track is through a member of either the Senate or the House of Representatives. And that process is known as the private member's bill. So those are really the two uh, systems. Now, as the bill goes through the legislative process, this is uh, the path that it takes. It starts with the first reading. I think the cameras are blocking part of the text. If you could just move back a little bit. Um, so it goes through first reading, second reading, then it goes to a, re a relevant committee or committees. The committees then organize a public hearing on the bill. They produce a report from that public hearing which is uh, presented to the plenary, whether uh, in the Senate or in the House of Representatives, uh, by the chair of the committee. Then that is followed by a clause-by-clause -clause consideration of the report. So every section is looked at and debated. And then the third reading takes place. And once they've gone through the third reading, that is usually followed up with a passage if uh, members agree to pass it. Now, uh, as I also said as part of the introduction, a bill can originate either in the Senate or in the House of Representatives, uh, but it can also be sent simultaneously to both chambers. So it goes through the process in both chambers. Uh, if it's only presented in one chamber, when it has been passed, it is sent to the other chamber. But if uh, it's presented simultaneously in both chambers, where the two chambers have passed the bill, then they will uh, harmonize the different versions that have been passed if the versions are different. So if uh, we have two different versions of the bill that have been passed by the Senate and the House of Representatives, the harmonization uh, process takes place. So that essentially requires each chamber to appoint several members that constitute uh, a conference committee. That would usually be made up of uh, the chairpersons of the relevant committees and then other members that the leadership of the chamber would appoint. Uh, so they then hold what is called a meeting of the conference committee. Now, depending on the length and the complexity of the issues, it is quite possible that harmonization can be done in one meeting. But if it's a very long bill, or if the issues are very complex, and the versions passed by both chambers are very different, then that harmonization process can take place over several meetings, in which case it takes a lot of time. And then uh, the, the committee then agrees on a single version, a harmonized version of the two uh, different versions, and then they produce a report from that conference committee process. Each of those uh, committees will go back to their uh, chambers, to their, um, well, to their chambers. So those from the House will go to the House and present the agreed version to the House for the House to adopt. Those from the Senate will go back to the Senate and present it for adoption. And uh, once they've adopted, it goes to the legal department for them to review and ensure that it meets all the technical requirements and uh, they produce what they call a clean copy and show that all the references to various sections, the numbering, all of those things are tidy and properly done. It then goes to the clerk of the National Assembly uh, and then the clerk transmits it to the president for assent. 
So that's sort of, in summary, the journey through the uh, legislative process. It sounds very easy, but I wish uh, it was as easy as this in real life when you are doing it. Sometimes in four years, this process might not be completed. Uh, sometimes, if they are really interested, in less than one year, you can actually get a deal go through this process. So a lot of factors are involved, but it's important that we are familiar with uh, that journey. And then in this next session, I have identified a number of opportunities in that journey for civil society, for citizens and other stakeholders to engage the process. So uh, this really identifies those uh, areas where um, you can engage the legislative process. And I start by saying that for me, the most important area is who drafts the bill. Because if you are drafting the bill, obviously you will put everything that you want in the bill. And therefore, you are starting from a position of strength. If you are not the one drafting the bill, then you are engaging a bill that has been drafted by somebody else and trying to change anything can be very difficult uh, because the person who drafted has come with a mindset, uh, perhaps an ideological position that you would have to do a lot of work to overcome. So if you want a good deal that uh, on an issue that you are very interested in, it is usually a good idea to take the initiative to produce the first draft. Obviously, even if you are drafting, uh, it's not your private letter. So it's important that that drafting uh, process be consultative and participatory. You have to bring key stakeholders together to be involved in that process. Uh, if you produce the draft, then have consultative meetings where others are able to comment, make input, so that it is a draft that uh, the key stakeholders are agreed upon. And when you produce the draft, then you decide how you want it to go to the National Assembly. So I've identified similar efforts. Um, one was uh, the Trafficking in Persons Bill. Uh, I think when that bill was passed, some of you in the room were too young to remember. So uh, that bill was drafted by Watcliffe. How many of us remember Watcliffe? Do we know Watcliffe? Yeah? Who ran what club or who formed it? You are not hearing me at the back? Okay, um, if you remember, Titi Abubakar at that time was uh, the wife of the vice president uh, who formed what club. So, although what club was an NGO, or it's an NGO, it became still in existence. It had a very strong link to government. So through that uh, relationship, the Trafficking in Persons Bill was sponsored as an executive bill. So it was something that was promoted by civil society, but it went through the legislative process uh, with the full backing of government as an executive bill. So if you have, if this bill, for instance, is something that the president is very interested in, given the track record of the bill so far, it's something you could actually sponsor as an executive bill. And of course, that would give it expedient consideration with the full backing of uh, the executive. Now, if the executive is not interested, the other possible track, which I've also referred to, it's uh, the one followed by the Freedom of Information Bill, um, which went as a private member's bill. Again, after the drafting of the Freedom of Formation Bill, at that time, President Thomas Aguilar was president, and we had proposed to him to uh, present it as an executive bill, and he told us to pursue it ourselves as a private member's bill. So we did just that. So, but it was also um, a successful effort, even though it was uh, drafted and uh, sponsored, promoted by civil society as a private member's bill. So the drafting process is a very important one, and I think that uh, if we want to have a good bill, it is important that we take that initiative. Even if we already have a bill that um, is going to be represented, 
uh, there might be some redrafting involved. Again, it's, it's a good idea to lead that effort. Then, of course, the other stages are in the second reading. The first reading, as I uh, explained in the document, it's really just a reading of the short title of the bill. There's no drama around it. There's no, uh, nothing much happens at the first reading. It's just a technical stage that um, the bill goes through. But during the second uh, reading, uh, which consists really of the reading of the long title. I hope everybody knows the difference between the short title and the long title. Is there anybody who is not familiar with that? So, if you take the Freedom of Information Bill, for instance, the short title was Freedom of Information Bill. The long title was a bill for an act to make public records and information more widely available to blah, blah, blah. So that's the long title. So during the second reading, the long title is read. And then it's followed by a debate of uh, the general principles of the bill. So members of the chamber, whether in the House or in the Senate, would speak either in support or in opposition to the bill. Uh, not not uh, necessarily in reference to specific provisions. They can talk about why is this an important issue, why do we need to make law on this, what is the context of that. So that's a huge opportunity for us to begin to engage. And uh, the kind of engagement that is required, because civil society, citizens have no right of audience in the chamber, essentially we're speaking to representatives. So we have to, at that point, already have people that we are relying on to articulate uh, issues on our behalf in relation to those bills. I say this with the greatest respect, but um, most of the people in the National Assembly really have no clue about these things. So if we leave it entirely to them to debate these issues, I think we might end up in a ditch. So we really have to be engaged to help them understand why these issues are important uh, and what the important aspects are, what the implications are, and so on. 